Welcome to the Daily Fantasy Flex Podcast. This is Brian. It is Tuesday night. I'm here with Colin and Pete uh, is back with us. Or I guess he never left us, but uh, Pete had a busy weekend, a good weekend, I think. Uh, we're going to talk some some PGA, guys. What's going on? Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's uh, back to kind of the normal double Euro slate. Uh, I guess that we had that last week, but uh, it's an interesting one for this week. Uh, looking forward to it. It's good to hear, Colin, because uh, I'm uh, going to be playing Euro this week, and I definitely need some advice from you. So uh, excited to hear who you like for the Euro uh, for the Euro guys this week. And uh, this is an interesting. I don't love the no cut events, but uh, you know yeah. it's another weekend to attack, and uh, I'm registered for games, so I've got to think about the best strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, neither do I. I kind of we'll get into why and kind of why it's different because it's still kind of like these events pop up, these no cuts pop up with such little frequency that I think it's still really speculative speculative in terms of what do people do differently and what not to do. But I think I'm getting way ahead of myself. So, uh, Brian, I'll, I'll, I'll still let you run the show here. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so before we, uh, before we get into this week's tournament, we're going to talk both Euro and PGA, uh, the Open to France, and also the uh, – um, the World Golf Classic Bridgestone. Uh, let's let's spend just a couple minutes talking about what we learned uh, for the Quicken Loans last week. Um, it was the week after the U.S. Open, obviously, a little bit of a lesser field. Um, do you guys have any anything that stood out to you? I, I know, uh, Pete, you said you didn't get to watch as much, but, uh, you know, just from reviewing articles, you had a lineup review out uh, this morning. Uh, is, was anything uh, groundbreaking or just kind of cool that we learned? I guess I'm happy that Hurley won, to be honest. I mean, he's something like 600th in the world, uh, huge payday. Obviously, Tiger Woods' tournament, he's, you know, cheering him on. And uh, maybe he gets an exemption for two years and all these other things. So, life-changing for him, uh, really exciting. Um, the one thing I made a mistake on is I made three teams, and two of my teams had ROM, and one of them, the Thunderdome team, didn't. And uh, I kind of used that. I kind of wussied out uh, when Bryson was up and coming. I obviously went all in, and uh, he's the other young stud who's uh, performed really well so far. And I'm I'm bummed that I uh, I missed him because that's kind of my mo. But uh, Colin, what about you? So Ron was actually the one I was going to bring up anyway. So maybe yeah, you can help me answer this question because I he didn't pop in anything that I was t- considering, and he is something like twenty percent owned across all slates. Uh, and higher in the higher stakes. He was yeah, a, he was a I, short play. Yeah. So it kind of came as a blind spot because like right now he's still like, I, I had, he'd never popped any of my models before. Uh, I went back and looked at him like, why is everyone owning him? And like, he's still pretty low sample size. Uh, and I guess I, I was just clueless in terms of where the hype train came from him. So he, you rostered him. Like, where did he come from? Considering that like, we never talked about him once and everybody Me. else in the middle was like, what's up? He's a stud from Europe, uh, obviously got the low amateur uh, at the U.S. Open, uh, but I think the reason he ended up being so heavily owned and sharp is his line move was just, like, outrageous. He moved more than almost anyone I've ever seen. He ended up being a bigger favorite than guys in the 9K range, um, you know, a lot of guys in the 9K range. So uh, I think that's what people saw is just this absurd line move. A lot of people invested in him to win, uh, obviously, and that's why the, the line moved so much. And yeah, I mean, he's just known, like, as a, as a stud. And uh, even just talking to some sharp golf guys before, uh, one guy in particular was like, I think this guy is really, really good. Uh, so there's, you know, people who follow the tour, people kind of, you know, are watching these tournaments and whatnot. There's a big hype around him. Uh, he's been really good as a young golfer. And, uh, yeah, the line move just kind of confirmed that for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, okay, so you call it just 80% line move type of you don't You don't think he – like I don't know. He ended like less than 70 to 1, and he was priced at whatever, 7, 70, 7,300 or something like that. And like all the guys in like the 9K range were like in that same range. So Yeah, was, so if he had flat line movement, do you think his, like his ownership would have been like single digits? I still think he would have been somewhat owned. I mean, obviously the more people watched the U.S. Open, so they knew who he was, and he was contending there for a while. Um yeah, I think you. It still would have been probably maybe fifteen percent, but the line move was just so massive. I saw him in like all the sharp guys' cash games too. Interesting. Yeah, I mean that's just one of those like he wasn't on my radar in the slightest. Clearly, it's a blind spot. Uh, maybe you kind of get that with sample size, and sample size will be its own kind of article in an upcoming week. But um, yeah, that's the one where it's like I'm gonna have to go back and like should I have caught him earlier? And if I did. Would I have done anything differently? So I, I don't know. It is remains to be seen. Yeah, we'll see what he we'll see what he ends up doing. I mean, he's another uh, big up and comer, and you know it's hard to deal not to deal with these. 
I'm just bummed because I went so hard on Bryson to pay dividends right off the bat. And I, I've gone pretty hard on Ron, but not hard enough. And, uh, you know, the regression will come, I'm sure. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens going forward with, like, his price and what his odds are. But definitely, a, you know, a talent that a lot of people are paying attention to. Interesting that uh, the movement would affect the ownership that much. I, I guess that is uh, – Makes sense in higher stakes tournaments, but it seems like it was pretty across the board there. Um, okay, let's let's move on. Let's talk about um, some tournaments this week. Uh, we'll start with the Euro, and Colin, we'll let you give your uh, your spiel and educate Pete and I on uh, on who to take in the Euro event. It's the hundredth uh, Open to France, um, and, and I'll just kick it to you. Uh, we have Rory in the in this field. He's not in the World Golf Classic, um, so um, curious what your thoughts on this course and some notable golfers for this week's Euro event. So, course fit generally says uh, the people who get a boost are more driving accuracy type, and then bad putters get a little bit of a boost. Um, I think the the big sh- the big shocker this week in the field of course price tag, uh, which is thirteen four right now, and like you rarely see people get above twelve five on PGA. So it's big, and he is you know the massive favorite here. Uh, he comes with his own asterisk because, you know, he's never played this course before. Uh, and he doesn't get quite as big as maybe a course boost to, or like a course fit boost because, you know, it rewards uh, bad putters and uh, more accuracy above everything else. So maybe his distance doesn't play as well here. But the real open question is, is there enough value you can essentially find to like uh, – roster like a 13-4 player. And I think there is in a couple interesting spots. So if you don't want to go the 13-4 route, and I totally understand if you don't, I think Bern Wiesberger is probably the other class of like that top tier. I like him a little bit more than say like Keimer or Molinari or even Danny Willett uh, based on course history. He easily has the strongest course history, uh, debatably in the field, but definitely of the top tier. Um, Outside of that, if you want to get uh, a little bit more mid rangey, I think I am shocked, honestly, that Rafa Cabrera Bale is here in this mid tier, eighty two hundred. I just like him. Like he, I think he, you could make a case for him better than some of those top tier guys. This just seems like there. I'm gonna look at is there something I'm missing because this feels like a borderline, almost like pricing mistake, which you just don't see with, in, with Vegas based pricing that often. But I think he's easily the class of the mid tier, followed up by some. Uh, some good recent names like Ross Fisher and Gregory Bordy, who has a home field advantage here in France. Um, and even in the bargain basement, if you kind of want to do our, our, our typical rundown, there's some decent high six, uh, 6,000 values here. I think Migo Coronen has a nice mix of history and course fit. Uh, David Horsey has just been playing really well lately, probably has the worst course history in the field. So take that with a grain of salt with what you will. But again, that kind of reflects his previous play and maybe not his current play. And then kind of cheapo favorites, Max Million Kiefer and Felipe Aguilar kind of round out uh, my end of the bargain basement. Uh, I think there are paths to Rory here, uh, long story short. Um, and there's a little bit more value here than previous slates. So that's kind of my quick rundown. Uh, Pete, questions, comments, concerns? I like all those plays. I think uh, Cabrera Bale is going to be a, a really popular guy in cash games. I imagine, you know, he seems like a guy that we're considering on PGA events. Uh, you know, not, not that expensive, but still up there. He's had some really nice showing. So, yeah, Rory is my main question. Can you make Rory fit? Because uh, I want to play Rory. But uh, – yeah, that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, let's move on to our, our PGA tournament. This week it is the uh, World Golf Classic WGC Bridgestone Invitational. Uh, it is played at the Firestone Country Club in Akron, Ohio. So uh, maybe LeBron will be there still celebrating the championship. Yeah. Who knows? He's on a yacht, man, partying with um, Yeah, we're going to have to settle for shirtless JR, which I am just fine to answer to him at really any event that we can get all year. That's not settling, Colin. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. People yeah. are rewarded if they get a shirt this year. <laughs> Pouring champagne on random girls. Yeah. All right, uh, so uh, it's played at the Firestone Country Club. Um, just some uh, quick notes about the World Golf Classic uh, Bridgestone. It is one of the four uh, World Golf Cl- uh, Championship events. Um, it, during the year, it is not a major, uh, so it doesn't have the prestige as a major, but it does have 
the purse of a major. The uh, the total uh, prize is uh, nine point five million, and the majors are usually around ten million total purse. So uh, it's not the prestige of the uh, the majors, but it is sort of the the money of them. So I think that uh, is the reason that we see such a loaded field outside of Rory. Uh, in, in the Euro tournament, uh, and also notable is there is no cut, which uh, we'll get into both of those nuances uh, in just a couple minutes when we talk strategy. Uh, but first, Colin, I'll kick to you um, and, and let you do your course a bit. What, what sort of course is Firestone? Um, this plays out as it, it reads pretty much as an accuracy course. I think that your ball strikers are going to be doing really well here. The guy that has easily the best course history here is Jim Furyk. It's kind of consistent with the shot maker type. Uh, I think accuracy and GAR are probably going to be the dominant things you look at this week. Um, and that sets up nicely for a couple people who have no course history here. And I think we'll do really well anyway. Uh, but yeah, I think it's an accuracy course above all else. Uh, a little bit shorter too. It's a par 70. So distance, maybe not as important. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Bob. I think it's an accuracy course and uh, I'm, I'm chasing some birdies this week. I've done a lot more research into some guys with birdies and uh, there's some, some plays I really like this week. Uh, I would prefer it if it was a course with a, or I would prefer if there was a cut, but uh I really feel good about uh, some of these guys for cheap. Is it a more of a greens or a driving accuracy sort of course, Colin, or is it just really hard to separate those two in their fit? Um, I mean, I get, yeah, it's always tough, but um, I think um, I'd probably maybe the driving accuracy a little bit more. I think that's just kind of a cleaner, like just, you know, don't miss the fairway type of thing. So, I mean, yeah, but it, it's still close, but yeah, I'd say driving accuracy. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, let's get into our, our questions because I think there's going to be quite a bit of um, interesting strategy to talk about. Um, and this course, as I mentioned just uh, a little bit ago, this tournament rather, uh, is unique. We've had some tournaments so far that have had no cuts, and we've sort of talked about that. We've had some tournaments that have a, uh, a less crowded field. Uh, there's about 60 golfers in this field as opposed to the normal that it could be up to 150. Um, so we've talked about that before. Um, we talked about all these different nuances, but this is probably the first tournament since we've had our podcast where you combine all of those. So uh, I'm curious to, to talk a little bit of strategy and how all of this sort of affects tournaments and cash games on DraftKings. We'll start with the no cut. We've had this before, uh, but for this particular tournament, Pete, what are your thoughts on that and how it's going to affect how you choose your players? And, and why don't you like it specifically? I mean, we're going to, do you feel like you have less edge here as a result of the no cut? Because that's the only reason why you wouldn't like something, right? Right. I think there's just a little bit more of an edge and in, in, in taking guys that, uh, especially in cash, you know, just identifying guys who are really good cut makers. And um, I don't know. I just, yeah, there's a different type, different type of strategy. I think you really have to chase birdies. You have to chase the upside. You know, guys shooting really bad is not nearly as bad when you they you obviously get to play all four rounds. And a lot of these guys are going to stick it out regardless because of the prize structure. So um, you really have to chase birdies and you have to nail the guys who are going to win. And uh, it definitely makes it more of a challenge. So Jim Furyk is a really interesting one. Uh, amazing course history, um, you know, finally getting back into form. But do we think he's going to, you know, really be the guy to win and make the most birdies? I don't know. Um, it's just, a, it's a very interesting tournament. And uh yeah, there's also less, uh, oh, you know, there's less uh, variations that you can make. There's hard, it's harder to find, like, these really contrarian plays. And there's only 60 guys for tournaments, too. So um, I like it, but I just don't like it as much as, uh, like, say, a major or other tournaments. Yeah. So I, this is actually kind of like a, a, a pet peeve of mine when people say, oh, well, you need to, in a no-cut, you, like, you really need to chase birdies. Because yeah. I've kind of always felt – I don't mean to pick on you or anything like that, but it's you like – You can always be chasing birdies. I agree with no, that. It's like you always want to chase birdies. So it's like I, – and I think kind of people fall back on that level of like, oh, what do you do differently? Because like it is kind of tough. I don't know that anybody has a good answer as far as like definitively what do you do differently and why. Um, these tournaments just don't come up that often enough to like learn the hard lessons or maybe make like a deep dive all that worthwhile. Uh, and I think my views on these no-cut things are changing. Uh, they're, they're always changing the more and more research that I do. 
So the last we left it, as we said, if um, all is being equal, a no cut means that everybody's guaranteed four rounds. And it's basically the equivalent of like what playing six quarters in an NBA game. Like there's maybe less various in terms of like expected outcome. Like if everybody's allowed to like play it out, like you'd expect it more to converge to what you'd expect to happen as opposed to the variance that a cut introduces. That's kind of, I still believe that's true, but I think there are also things and uh, different things in play here that matter for um, what type of game you're playing. So this week's article was about uh, my first non-projection metric stuff was like the idea of floor and ceiling and how it looks in PGA as opposed to other sports. And one of the things I'm kind of hinting at is with the elite players, uh, I think they're maybe more valuable in cash games like in a cut format than I thought because A, they have a level of cut security that kind of like you like is worth paying for and B their upside is also sometimes enough to overwhelm, like to essentially make up for like, if you guys miss the cut, it's like, if you have Jason day put up 117 at sawgrass, like it almost doesn't matter if you have guys miss the cut because he just has the chance to basically make you whole. Uh, and you don't necessarily need that in a no cut format where like the the cost of a mistake is not nearly as bad because there's not a cut so i think that cheapens the value of that kind of like essentially nuclear bomb that like a really good guy could drop so you don't need that couple that with um finishing points ha are have a little bit of inflation here because you know if there's 60 people then like it's almost it's tough to not finish in the top 50 so it's like everybody has like a high number of finishing points uh and that kind of takes away like mo most of the times those go to the top players and so they're kind of their their value is essentially diluted a little bit so that's a long-winded way of saying that i think balanced may be the right approach and i can definitely see other people say oh go stars and scrubs because you know scrubs won't miss the cuts it's not as bad but i think it might actually be the opposite so that's really long-winded all right i'll let you guys get a word in a little bit to see which parts you disagree with agree with all of that it's an interesting take uh i definitely i mean i guess like if someone like a bubble watson or someone who might i i should i need to really think about this but those elite players that might make a ton of birdies but miss the cup more often probably have more value in something like this. Um, like a J.B. Holmes or whatever? Like, you know, yeah, oh, J.B. Holmes is a lock. Yeah. He's a stone-cold lock. J.B. Holmes over the last year is the eighth-highest birdie average. Love his price. I mean, what, I'm going all in. I wish it was a distance course versus an accuracy, but I'm still I'm still on J.B. Holmes. But, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, um, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, I'm speculating, too, when I'm talking about how to think about it. Uh, just in general, I haven't had as much success with these events. Maybe that's just random, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what yeah. it is. And, and I think like the, the point is all of this, um, once we kind of have a full slate of PGA data over the course of the year and really have this detailed stuff, this is an answerable question with essentially like very detailed lineup review. Uh, and that'll be like, I'm going to lay it out that like once I've kind of finished up my non-projection metrics, like how do you do this for like really in-depth like data intensive lineup review uh but i think this is going to be an answerable question at least from a data perspective like what do you do differently so i'm looking forward to being able to answer that colin you said you you don't want to give up birdies potentially and in, in, in a normal cut week uh you don't want to not chase birdies any week really but it seems like there's a give and take there i mean you're going to potentially have to give up birdies a couple times uh, or, or in a few instances to get this, the safety of a made cut, right? Um, yes and no. Like the, I mean that, I don't know that, that that's necessarily a given. Like the, are birdies a trade, like do birdies trade off with um, cut safety? Like that's, I, I don't know. I don't think that's a, that's a speculative position. I don't think we can answer what? like, an example of like where like, you know that there's a guy who like always oh, a safe cut, but like doesn't make a whole lot of birdies. I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> the guys who are the safest are the best players in general, so there's a correlation with that. I do think yeah. there's someone like you would like. Let me let's say this is a, a distance course. You can come up with someone who would be I would favor maybe slightly more hypothetically as like Finau, for example. Guy gets on the roll, makes a lot of birdies, but he's also uh, a guy who makes a ton of these huge numbers. And maybe there's some value, and where there might be value in this tournament is identifying the guys 
who make double bogeys or worse more often than other guys. Because, like, you don't get penalized, like, if you're yeah. a quadruple. Like, it, yeah, quads you. kill you for making the cut, but they don't kill you in this format. Um, obviously, they kill your finishing score, but you can still do really well. Uh, so I think that's where you'd look. I think we always should be chasing birdies, always looking for those guys. I think, in general, those are going to be the better golfers anyways because that's the whole key. But I do think there's in this – there's some way to look at like the shot making. I think uh, thinking about it more, I think we should identify uh, maybe the guys who make double bogeys or worse because the penalty on DraftKings is not severe uh, yeah. at all. So maybe we should break up, up yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe we should break up upside and consistency into more of like individual shot percentages. I don't know. Possibly. I mean, then you have to adjust for the difficulty of the course as well because yeah, like I'm not going to fault anybody for like quad bogeying Oakmont just because like yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Sure. Uh, and then the the other uh, part of this is that it's it's such a small field. We usually have 150 golfers to choose from. Now we only have uh, about 60. So I'm curious how this affects strategy. I I am guessing that it may not affect strategy for a, a for cash game players that much because I know Pete, you have a core that you really like that you build around, um, and that sort of doesn't matter whether whether you have 150 or 60 golfers because it's not like your core was going to be 100 golfers and all of a sudden you have to cut it down. You were looking at 10 golfers anyway. So it's, it doesn't it does it not affect you as much uh, as a cash game player as opposed to a tournament one? Yeah, I mean, it definitely affects uh, tournaments, Mark, it's hard to find those low and leverage plays. But, uh, yeah, cash games are just making the most opt- – they're making the optimal team. So same sort of process and uh, – I think I got some gems. I think I got some guys that Colin's going to be on as well. Yeah, I think the only the only thing that I can think like maybe logically playing out when there's 60 players from a tournament perspective, because you're right, cash doesn't change a whole lot that more, is it's probably a little bit harder to be contrarian. And right. if you want to get those like sub 1% owned, like there are fewer opportunities there for that. And if you truly believe that finding the sub one percenters that like have a decent flyer doing well is your source of edge, Mm -hmm. then it would stand to reason that a shorter lineup slate means you would have less edge in a given week. So maybe you just bet less. If you want to go by bankroll management or Kelly criterion or whatever your favorite like wagering tool is, Um, that's the only way that I could realistically see it playing out. I think that I was saying before, like maybe the, like the extreme analogy is the two game slate on NBA how do you treat it differently? Do you just bet less because you think you have less edge? Maybe that's true for PGA, but I don't know how much less edge you'd have in a 60 versus a 150. I, it's probably right. enough to like downshift how much you put out there, like all that much. It's not even really the 1% guys, I think, in tournaments. It's like there's, when there's more golfers, there's more guys in every range. So oftentimes you can find, okay, uh, this week, let's just go to this week. I'm not, I don't have a great example now, but – uh, I imagine a lot more people are going to play Furyk and Kucher than, say, Brooks Kepka. Maybe. I'm not, maybe that's not true. But uh, you find someone in a range, and those plays that are really, you know, it looks like there's a clear guy who's better at a certain price than another one in, like, the 9000 or 8000 range, you can really get a lot of leverage with those other plays. And it's harder to find those guys. And the guys that are like that are still more owned than they were in other weeks because there's only $60 to choose from. So – just makes it harder to find leverage, and uh, that definitely is the strength of certain players in DFS. Okay. Yep, I'd agree with that. All right, sounds good. And then my last question, but this is going to transition us right into our uh, player analysis. Uh, we'll go over players. It's going to be guys that are 9K or higher. It's going to be the top tier, mid-tier, 7K to 8.9, and the lowest tier is going to be below 7K. Um, it's going to be sort of an, an interesting week since guys are not exactly in that range. So I'll let you guys be a little more flexible with your ranges. Um, you can sort of, uh, the guys in the 6K, 7K, and we can go up from there. Uh, but my third question is, what does it say that Day is such a huge favorite this, despite the smaller and better field? Uh, we would think that in a tournament where it's, um, it, it, it's a stronger overall tournament and there's less golfers that – Maybe the, the odds to win would be a little more distributed among golfers, but Day is still such a huge favorite. Uh, so, Colin, I'll kick to you, and I'll let you start with the top golfers that you like the most. Um, does it just make Day that amazing, that much more amazing of a play this week? Uh, I mean, that's always a question as far as, like, people try to linearly, like, interpolate, like, Vegas odds versus, like, actual success chance to win. For better or for worse, like, I don't know. Like, I have Dustin Johnson coming slightly ahead of Jason Day for what it's worth. And I'm openly wondering if that's right for a couple of reasons. One, his course history is just not that great. 
And a note to our readers when you're kind of looking into fantasy labs, remember this is like a 60 person field. So like when you look up finishing positions, you kind of have to adjust for the fact that like none of them are all that great. So he actually rates pretty poorly, uh, poorly in some of these. Um, but I think the reason that um, I give him maybe a little bit more edge is I just think the, I mean, A, yeah, he's been playing well lately, but I don't, I wouldn't call him like playing better than Jason Day. Um, I think is just driving distance, just like it, it basically he sets up as like a birdie. Like that's the guy you want for birdie chasing uh, just because his distance is that much better um, that like, okay, maybe he's more worthwhile in drafting his points. So like, I, I don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm still torn on which one of those guys I like more. But other than that, I don't have a, I think the only one that I could see realistic fitting in is probably Kapka. Just because, like, his price, like, he has a similarly, like, good distance, decent course history, uh, just below the 10K range. I think he can, it's easy, he's easier to build around. So he's the only one that I see realistically uh, making his way into lineups. Maybe Patrick Reed, just because he's still decently cheap. Um, but, yeah, I don't, like, I, you could make a case for either Johnson or Day, depending on, like, how you want to weigh course history and maybe it's vastly different in uh, no cut. So I'm actually kind of scratching my, scratching my head on that one. Um, Pete, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is, and I forget if we covered this before, um, what do you do with the guy who just won his first major the next term and after? And is that an angle? I seriously don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's an angle or not. I mean, I'm, Dustin's just playing so well in general. I mean, he's just, playing better than anyone on tour, honestly. So um, I think he's been this guy, and I, I don't know how much it affected him, you know, after the fact. But, uh, you know, sometimes people talk about letdowns. I'm not going to judge it any differently. Day, day and uh, Dustin's a really tough call. I mean, I think if you need the 500, you go down to DJ. Uh, I think in the top range, Kucher and Furyk, if you're going to buy the accuracy angle, are, are really, really nice plays. Um, I love Kucher for cash games. This, this maybe is an example of where, Kucher's not quite as valuable uh, as he would be other weeks where you basically know he's going to make the cut every time. He's basically yeah. in like a top 10 machine. Uh, but in this format, like just getting a top 10 doesn't really differentiate as much as it does other weeks where you have, you know, a huge disparity between the guys who make the cut and the guys who don't. Um, I like I like a lot of guys uh, in the expensive range. You can make an argument for a lot of them for tournaments. Like Adam Scott, I think you could make a really good argument for him in tournaments. I think he'll be the lower owned. Uh, guy out of these 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 top names. Um, don't don't mind anyone else that you mentioned. Um, Bubba is intriguing to me with the birdies. I don't know. He doesn't have the game for an accuracy course as much, but if he gets going the right direction, he could really put up a nice score. Um, and you don't have to worry about him just blowing up and missing a cut. He's going to stick this one out for the paycheck, which is nice. Uh, I don't have too many sharp things to say about the the top tier. I think the the really sharp plays are kind of in the medium range to low range. Colin, well, uh, like uh, that example of Kucher where he gets top tens but doesn't necessarily ever win the tournament, what, what is your thoughts on that as an analytical guy? I mean, what's the difference between a fourth place and a first place? Just randomness, variance? I mean, mm, I guess a I mean, It's probably a stroke or two, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a whole lot. Um, and that kind of thing should come out in, like, long-term adjusted round where, like, I mean, is there – that, that's kind of like the concepts of like, you know, the fifth gear. What does it take to get over the top type of thing? Uh, I'm open to maybe some of that is mental. Maybe some of that is actual physical tools. Like maybe you need distance to just like pull, like, you know, if you're just you're being super aggressive, like the one day that like you hit all of your aggressive shots and like that's what it takes to get like that, like second or third Sigma or whatever from the normal curve. Uh, I don't know. I'm open to just being like, Straight up distance. It's tougher to win a tournament without distance. Isn't that what Luke Donald tried? Like when we were talking about Harbor Town, like he tried to push himself to win majors. Do we have that conversation? I feel we like did. we did, and he that, that's what he tried to do. Yeah, and was it because like to get into that like upper level, like I want to win, not can like do well? Exactly. Okay, so maybe it's just distance, like, and that's cons that that'd be explainable for something like Kucher. Okay. Uh, before we move on to this next year, I'm, I'm curious your guys' thoughts. When is the week that we regret not taking Jordan going to come? Oh, how cheap does he have to get? Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe that's a better question. Yeah. Of, like, so one, once he gets like, um, I think uh, 
what Jason Day briefly got down to 10-8, like at the beginning of the year, and I think we properly flagged it then. I think once Jordan drops below 11,000, like that's probably when a red's going to sink in. But like, if he was priced like Adam Scott, he'd be a lock this week. Uh, if he was 10-5, but uh, yeah, 11 3 is probably still just a little too expensive. So close to DJ, too, it really has to be kind of a leverage play at that point if you're going to justify it. Yep, I agree. Okay. Uh, and, and Pete, you mentioned this. You're curious about what to do with a guy after uh, he wins a major. Dustin Johnson uh, playing for the first time, or are you, uh, is he like a heavy fade candidate in tournaments because of potential ownership boost? I think he's a fine fade. I definitely prefer, uh, you know, going a different direction than him in tournaments. He will be popular. So don't mind that. Don't mind fading him in tournaments at all. Who do you guys think is going to be more popular in tournaments, Day or, or DJ? By DJ slightly. Both, yeah, I, don't, I don't have a strong impact. I, I would go 50 50 and do a cop Pretty on close. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay. All right, let's move into the next tier, which will just sort of, this is a such an abbreviated field. Uh, we'll go in the like high nines to 8K range. There's a bunch of golfers in that range. Who stands out in that sort of not about, not mid tier, but just slightly ahead of them? So you want to go 8 to 8 9, basically? Yeah, or just yeah, we can go like seven, seven to eight, nine. These are just arbitrary cutoffs at this yeah, point. I'm sort of just trying to divide it up evenly here. Um, all right, Pete, I think you're up first. All right, my favorite golfer this week is Jason Duffner uh, in this price range. Absolutely love Duffner. Uh, I think he's an incredible play. Uh, if you look at his last year weighted birdie average, uh, he's right up there in the top 12, 13 guys. Um, I think he has good course history here, too. I'll have to check into that. He's rating really well in my models. He hits it pretty accurately, and I just think he's been playing really well. 8,500 tag, too. I, I think that's fine. I mean, it's been a ton of events. I'd like him even more if this was a cut event, but uh, I still think he's a, a really nice play. Um, I think Leishman's interesting at this price range. Shane Lowry is a guy who uh, – you talk about a guy who's wildly inconsistent, but, you know, you don't have to worry about him missing the cut. And let's look at his last couple of rounds. It's like missed cut 39th, missed cut 16th, uh, 23rd, missed cut second. Uh, he's a guy who's really intriguing in this format. Uh, Phil Mickelson's intriguing a little bit. I like him less than the guys I just mentioned. Uh, Daniel Berger's been playing well. Um, there's a lot of guys in this range, but I think Duffner is easily my favorite. Uh, I like Leishman a lot, and then Lowry's the, the tournament guy I'm going to have a lot of. Um, I don't know that I necessarily ju- – Duffner doesn't jump out the same to me as you, and it's for a reason we have talked about already. His like, – I think his biggest value is a cut maker, almost like the poor man's man. Uh, and I just think, like, if, if I'm taking a line of, like, cut makers aren't as valuable in the no-cut format, then, like, yeah, like, some, like something inconsistent like, would be a little bit better. I think Daniel Berger is my favorite overall, like, for this range. A, like, the no-cut plays to his strengths, according to, the you know, the new, like, floor and ceiling stuff I'm playing around with. Like, he has been historically inconsistent, uh, like, more so than anyone else in this range. But uh, that doesn't seem to matter here. And plus, it's just – he's just pl- – I think he's playing the best right now of everybody else in this field – or of everybody else in this range. Uh, I'm pulling up his recent results. I think he had a good showing at the U.S. Open. Yeah, like 37th. It wasn't bad. He won the week before with that great performance. Uh, yeah, hasn't missed a cut since March. Uh, I mean, not that like that matters here, but just like it's just like I I think he has the best uh, resume in the, in the past 12 weeks of anyone here. So he has the highest chance of getting into all the lineups in the mid-tier range. Are we including JB in this this tier? Because I no. assume you guys love him. Okay, we're not. That's, I mean, yeah, that's why I'm not gushing all over my monitor right now, like in, in excitement for JB Holmes. <laughs> okay. Any anyone else in that um, sort of just above the uh, the value range? I mean, I could make a case for Lowry based on my case a combination of uh, history and course fit, but like I just. Burger is like just for 500 less for a comparable uh, projection. He has the greatest chance of getting in there. So what's up with Burger's um, his accuracy, long term accuracy is not sort of a guy that you we yeah, thought we would want to target in this tournament. Going no, it's not. I mean, it's not like it's not great, but it's also not terrible either. So like, what models? He's around like 59 percent. Like it's not mm-hmm. like a. It's not, it's not bomber bad like J.B. Holmes for 54 or whatever. 
Yeah. Uh, it takes more to his recent long term, his recent adjusted round, basically. It's just yeah. like his. And he's young, so you're just buying on time. I'm glad that you say you really like Berg. Cause I, I, I initially was a little lukewarm, but now I think I think he makes a ton of sense. I mean, he's the rookie of the year on the PGA Tour last year, really coming into form now. Uh, it's just too cheap a price tag for his talent, I think. He's also a freak athlete. His dad a, was a professional tennis player. And Ooh, okay. he, he came from tennis, and you can even see it in his swing. And, uh, yeah, I just think there's a lot of upside with him long, long term. Okay. All right. Let's move on to this uh, this bottom tier, uh, which will just be sort of everyone else uh, in the 7K and 6K range. There's only three or four golfers in the 5K range. There's usually a, a whole uh, whole slew of these guys, but there's only three or four this week because of the uh, the shorter field. Uh, so 7K, 6K range. Uh, JB is in this range. We also have uh, Grio and Smiley's down here as well. So I'm curious your thoughts. Pete, I think it's you. It's it's calm, but it's still Grio. He's a lock okay. for me. Yeah, that's what, yeah. I think like it's the number one and number two as they always seem to pop up every week. JB Holmes and uh, Emiliano Grio. Uh, Grio doesn't have course history here, but like if you're going accuracy, I think he fits it like uh, better than anybody else. Uh, Holmes probably benefits from that essentially no cut format, where it's just like you know free. It's if he's if you're chasing birdies, like it's kind of like uh, you know he's he'll hit him one of those days, uh, and he's guaranteed to play four. So I like him particularly well in this format. Um, let's see other like all around. I think decent value plays here. I'm still pretty high in Harris English, who I tend to like from week to week. Uh, and his price tag hasn't changed a whole lot, even as he's kind of continued to meet his expectations, if not exceed them. So I think he's a decent like value spot there. If you want to go super bargain bin, um, which I don't necessarily know that you need to in a no cut, uh, names that pop for me are Andrew Johnston. Eesh. Who, like, yeah. Eesh. You know, that he's, he, dude, he is, that's a sharp play, I think. Yeah. If you I had a great tweet how he was uh, looking for a barbecue place during the rain delay in the uh, at Oakmont. So he also played there. <laughs> uh, he's got a Euro win. This I think he his Euro win in Spain. I think it was his first in the year. He made a big showing about that, and he's just from what little I've read, he just seems like your constant. If nothing else, he's fun to root for, which has no bearing on setting lineups. But um, I think he is like he's. Definitely under the right from name recognition alone. Uh, I think his ownership is like is probably going to be way less from name recognition. So definitely even better in tournaments. Uh, and then if you really need savings, if you want to go like superstars and scrubs, I think Jim Herman remains the best sub six K player. He just keep like he's. I seem to mention him every week in bargain bin, but here he is again at fifty eight hundred, and uh, he keeps putting up better results. So. His price hasn't moved, but his performance has. Yep. I like all those guys that you mentioned. I don't really have anyone to add. I was going to talk about Beef. Uh, just had some funny things to say about him, but uh, mm-hmm. kind of already got him out there. I think Rio's a great play. I think J.B. Holmes a great play. You can argue for a variety of other guys down here. But, uh, yeah, you know, the one guy I guess I, I might take a flyer on in some tournaments, Soren Kelson, who I was really high on in Oakmont, who ended up uh, not doing too well. But, uh yeah, I think there's a lot of good plays in this range, highlighted by Grio and J.B. Holmes. Yeah, I mean, Soren, like, I mean, it's probably the best course history. Oh, Russell Knox. I'll have Russell Knox, too, for sure. Sorry. Yeah, that's like what – Russell Knox remains one of those, again, no course history, but he's a ball striker for sure. Definitely really accurate. He, um, like – I think you generally like Russell Knox a lot more than I do. And it's one of those where I keep going back. I mean, it's not ter- It's not like I don't like it or anything like that, but just like, I don't, I think there, are, I have a lot of guys above him in the same range. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out why. Um, it's just been good, man. Just look at yeah, his, like, I mean, I mean, I, the only time he misses it are on longer court. He's just a, he's a ball striker. I, I like him. I think he's good. I just yeah. like him. I have no, he, I, he doesn't do as well as putt. He's not a great putter, but in terms of just, you're why you're watching him play like four or five holes. He's going to hit the fairway. Then he's going to hit the green, and that's pretty nice. Yeah, I have no problem. I, I agree a hundred percent on course fit. Um, I don't know. I just I'm looking. So I'm looking over his log and stuff. And the only thing that kind of jumps at me, I guess, is that second place at uh, the Heritage. Uh, I mean, his sawgrass accuracy course. Like, yeah, maybe like that's. Um, 
maybe that's like I mean, so you you play him like when you know it's an accuracy course, you're like pretty much like he's a lock for you generally. Yeah, that's that's the only time I play him. If it's a bombers course, I won't touch him. But if it's an accuracy course, I do, and I just I feel like that's just what you kind of have to do with him. He's not yeah. a great player, but you watch him like he just hits the fairway, and he's so good with his irons. So with yeah, with course fit, it's like you can. To me, it's like when you're doing a course fit, you know, routine. It's all right. Fit your key stats. Give everybody their boost accordingly. It's possible that other people may have like be prone to super course fits. I guess where like he really tears. Even though he has like, is that feasible? Where even though he has the same ball striker stats as a guy next to him, he'll really eat up a ball striker course for some reason that is not coming through in the stats. Maybe. Like, I, I still have. I, what am I missing on Knox? Like you know, like if you like him so much, like all right, I'll go. Back. What am I he's lower than Grio and Holmes for me for sure. So it's not like he's a. He's just like a guy. If it's a ball striker's course, I'm gonna have exposure to him in tournaments, and he might find his way into my cash game. It's like that's. It's just like one of those things. Like you know, a certain course, you want certain guys, and uh, yeah, to back it up with data, I think that you would find if you just back test, he does do feel even more. I would I would speculate that he does even slightly better on, you know, these ball striker courses than someone, you know, has a similar comp. I just think he really, truly is one of the elite iron players. Uh, there was a strokes gain stat when I was watching the players. They kept talking about, like, I think it was between, like, uh, 125 and 175 yards. He's, like, number one or two on tour hitting the green. So just, like, his mid irons are just on point. So I tend to like him with these, these ball striker courses. Okay. Yeah. There's some strokes gain stuff that people get really into, so maybe that's why you don't – but you're not <laughs> that's the max. Wow. All fair, like yeah, point and all of that. No, I I'm more interested in the idea of like straying into the idea of like individualized course fit and kind of moving away from like you know I have my general rules. Where do the general rules break down? How do you know if they're like who might be breaking them? I think Russell Knox sounds like a pretty good test case of like, yeah, ball strikers do generally well, ball striking courses, but he does really well. And it's like, how would I tease that out from the data uh, if right. it's something you pick up from watching it? So I probably have to think about that a little bit uh, and even test and see if I can pick it up. So I don't know. That's okay. He kind of has be become my mid year head scratcher for it's like, why does everyone like Russell Knox a lot better than I? And Colin, one real quick thing going all the way back to our initial ROM. I was just, I was reading some more about him too. He's the number one world amateur player. He's number one in those rankings. I mean, he's really, he's a definite uh, kind of prodigy just in the same vein as uh, Bryce. Is. So I think that's why he was so popular last week. People knew that came on, had a great U S open finish, which that, that does say something to me. Like if an amateur can play well at a U.S. open, like Oakmont where it's just treacherous conditions. Obviously they have to be really skilled and uh, the line move, uh, I think just solidified it for a lot of people. Yeah. Maybe it's a, I think people are just drawn to high performing amateurs when they can play. It was the same uh, thing. I, I am. I'm, I admit it. I'm yeah, I know. Like, I, mean, I was not going to mention oh, you cannot be named at all here, but I even remember last year after the British open, Everybody was on an Ali Schneider chance kick, and his ownership was just, like, super high. Yeah. Uh, and it's never necessarily made a whole lot of sense about, like, why is everybody it rushing? probably to doesn't make enough sense. But uh, it may, it, it, from a psychological reason, right, everyone wants to be – it's like buying a stock. Everyone wants to be right, you know, on the, the young guy. You want to – Yeah, wanna, that ha yeah like, rise. you want to be particularly, like – but, like, it doesn't work like that like it does for NFL, like, when you can legitimately say, like, Todd Gurley is an efficiency pr efficiently priced because he hasn't gotten touches yet. Right. And it doesn't work the same way in PGA, and yet everybody still has that same mentality of, like, I got to buy low, but it's like you're not buying nearly as low as you think you are. Um, and I will have an article on this specifically. One of my non-projection metrics that I want to talk about is essentially sample size and distilling that into an actual metric, like how do low sample size guys in general fare compared to higher sample size guys. So there is a data-driven reason for why I'm kind of sour on low sample size guys and kind of like mm -hmm. the, the shiny new toys. So, but that's down the road. Yeah, cool. that's interesting. Uh, Pete, so it sounds like you like a lot of these guys in the in the lower range. Part of that is probably just the uh, the abbreviated field. It pushes some more talented golfers down into that range. Uh, but if you like, you know, JB and Grio and, and Knox, is it going to allow you to uh, get up to one of these top guys day in, in DJ and Cash? Probably, yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't fully decided yet, but I'll definitely have some lineups like that. And then I think there's arguments to make like a Fury, Kucher, Kepka lineup or something like that. With you know, there's a lot of things you can do this week, so it'll be fun. 
Okay, cool. Uh, who's going to win, Pete? Uh, who's going to win? Who's a good one to take for who's going to win? Um, Patrick Reed should be Damn sick. it, that was mine. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry trying. for it. Oh, that's uh, fine. As long as I get – all right, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with Patrick Reed. No, 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 no you guys stay with him. It's fine. Just go, Ryan, ask me first next week. Okay. Um, I assume Pete would know that you were going to take Patrick Reed and stay away. But. I thought he was going to take him, but I, I, I wanted to be I wanted to beat him to the punch here. <laughs> That's fine. Um, all right, I'll go like on a I don't know like the, who's right next to him. Similar course history, dark horse. I go Justin Rose. Why not? Like, I like that. Yeah, Justin Rose. All right, and you're going Rory for the uh, the French. Yeah, that's it. it's super heavy chalk. I don't have like if nothing else, like I'll be mean, like yeah. L- listeners should be aware. Pay attention to Rose's back. It, it has been bothering him just FYI. But I like that as a tournament play, regardless. Okay. He's here, so you know he's gonna play. There's a big incentive to finish, so I, I love it as a tournament play. Plus his uh, his paycheck is now in dollars, which is are so much more valuable than his day to day pounds. So he'll definitely have incentive. Uh, way there to, you go. Uh, Sharp move. Way to way to incorporate some market stuff into this as well. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, I like it. Uh, cool. So definitely make sure to uh, to check out the models as they update. Uh, coolest part about our player models as data comes in, they auto adjust. As we've talked about in this podcast, uh, it's definitely important to keep. Uh, keep in mind uh, of uh, weather as that it updates throughout the week, especially on Wednesday night, and line movement as it moves as well. Uh, keeping up with data as it comes in is definitely, definitely important as you're making your lineup. So keep up with the player models for sure. Uh, Colin P, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks guys. Yeah. Thank All right. Good cool. Good luck, everyone. We'll talk to you guys next week.